But anyhow, this evening's talk, I wanted to spin a talk about a spiritual subject which is very badly understood but is so important in our lives and that is freedom. We all talk about freedom and religion is supposed to give you some sort of freedom and we fight for our freedoms and uh, either politically or more importantly spiritually, individually, just we aspire to be free but how many of us always feel that we're locked into something that we're prisoners of some event or some situation which causes a huge amount of trouble and we just try and try to break free because the whole idea of freedom when you were a small kid was something very attractive which you sought for but maybe you have never achieved. As kids we want to be free. When we're sort of middle aged we're still trying to be free but we tend to get more entangled the more we try to be free. So what actually is this freedom and how is it actually achieved? And first of all I would use the word religious freedom as what we call an oxymoron. <laughs> because religion doesn't give you freedom and I say that as a religious person even those of you who may be scholars know that sort of word religion it actually sort of comes from to bind it's the same like the religion the ligger, like ligature, remember ligature in, in sort of that's something which ties you up and blocks you so actually religion and freedom are actually opposites there and I know I've gotten into a lot of trouble, but I think it's a really, really good point that you, know, you should be very careful about religions trying to create freedom from themselves because what I'm talking about religion here, hopefully it's not what you understand coming to a place like this, but a lot of religion is about controlling you, having some sort of being up there working through the priest to control what you do, what you say and how you live. And if you look upon it that way, how can you have control and at the same time be free? How can you have people telling you what to do, how to behave, how to live and still have freedom? And actually I've made that point that even in law, I'm just, well maybe I'll just uh, spend one or two minutes on this that traditionally that Buddhism has sort of gone in another direction so much so that people actually do say is Buddhism really a religion? and I've often asked that question and the standard answer is Buddhism is a religion for tax purposes only We've got to be practical and you know, we've got to pay our bills so we get all the, the benefits of being a religion for taxes but hardly anything else because Buddhism is not supposed to be controlling you and that was right there from the very beginning. I've mentioned this to many universities, many of you might not know that democracy did not start in Greece that is a myth which is about time it was opposed. If you look in the ancient Buddhist texts, the Buddha was describing long-standing democratic systems in India 25 centuries ago. Remember the Buddha was around before Socrates, about a hundred years beforehand. So there was thriving democracies and that was the system which the Buddha grew up in. And that was the system which actually the Buddha gave to our monastics, our monks and our nuns. Our constitution is democratic. Even though I am the abbot of a monastery, even though we sort of joke I'm the spiritual dictator of the Buddhist society of West Australia, in practice I'm not, you can't do anything like that. And even in monasteries we have to have meetings where every monk has the same vote as I do. It is a democratic system and why? It's because the whole idea of this path is actually to try and let go of that control both in one's inner world and also in the outer world, in the outer expression. In the same way that although you have been here for many many years 
Now you've probably noticed that there's hardly any controlling done of you here. You can come in and go out whenever you want. We don't sort of control you by sort of saying you have to give a donation as you go in. Even better, we don't say, well, entry is free, but you've got to give a donation to get out. I often thought of that would be a great way of... <laughs> so there's a lot of freedom, even the fact you don't have to pay to actually to listen to these talks, even when you go to our retreat center. It's all done by donation. There's something in that which is fundamental to what I'm going to be talking about this evening. That what is actually real freedom and how hopefully the way we teach our Buddhism here, that what we do here in this center is an expression of what freedom should really, really mean. But first of all, what most people take to be freedom, you know, your freedom to do whatever you want, whenever you want, and however you want to do it. What most people in our world strive for. And have ever noticed that modern life is always trying to create greater freedoms? But we always feel that we are more imprisoned. There are certain freedoms which is so important, we're so grateful that people have fought for these. You know, the freedom sort of your sexual orientation, the freedom of gender, the freedom actually to choose you know, what's a particular uh, role in society you want to take. Those are important ones which we have won. But, how free do you feel in this modern world? And sometimes, sometimes that people ask me that question. Ajahn Brahm, do you really feel free being a monk? You have all these rules and restrictions, all these things which you just aren't allowed to do. How can you feel free when you have this whole list of prohibitions? And that's a very good question. But the point is that I was a lay person for 23 years of my life and I could do whatever I wanted. But now I'm a monk and I have all these restrictions. And I remember those times and I remember the times now. And I remember, or I know, strangely enough, I feel more free as a monk than I ever felt living in the world, being able to come and go wherever I wanted. Why is that? I read in a newspaper recently, I think it was in a zoo in New Zealand, a couple of panthers, I think it was, escaped from their enclosure. And they made people very scared as they were walking in the zoo, and these panthers were walking in the zoo as well. But the panthers weren't going to harm anyone, they were just going for a little excursion. And then they went back into their cage. Because if you ask any animal in the zoo, they probably like being in their cage. They like being in the zoo. Why is that? Think about it. A panther in the zoo gets probably better food than they would ever get in the wild. Not only that, they get much better accommodation as well. It must get very cold sometimes in the wild, sometimes very hot. There are droughts, there are floods. But in a zoo, you are a pampered panther. Even when you get sick, if you're in that zoo, you actually get doctors looking after you. How many panthers in the wild would get free medical care? If you get sick, it's tough luck in the wild. But there in the zoo, you get well looked after. You get balanced meals every day. And you probably get entertainment. You see all these stupid people coming and poking their teeth. What a wonderful thing it was. So, you ask you, where would you rather live if you were a lion or a tiger or an elephant? Where would you rather live? In the jungles? Being hunted? With your habitat always being restricted, getting less and less of every year? Or would you, with Sometimes you don't know if you're going to eat or not. Or would you rather be in a zoo with all modern conveniences? 
for the modern panther. Where would you rather be? Now sometimes you could see that the choice would be, yes, I'd rather be in that zoo, in that cage, in that containment. And why is that? Because there's many, many things which you are free of. We call this the freedom from dangers. And a lot of times our aspiration for being free is always balanced. Balanced by, yes, we may be able to come and go wherever we want in the jungle, but then that costs a lot of dangers and a lot of difficulties as well. I don't know, some of you might think, oh it must be so nice being a monk, living in nature. But anyone who's ever lived in nature knows that sometimes I look forward to coming here on the weekend because over there in Serpentine there's the flies, there's the ticks, there's all the other wonderful things in nature like mosquitoes. Now sometimes tomorrow I'm going um, on uh, to Malaysia and one of the days I'm going to teach a retreat, you know, just a day retreat. And it's in a temple in Kuala Lumpur and they have tried to design the room to look more like a forest because Buddhist monks are supposed to live in forests. So they painted trees on the wall and they've made it look rustic. And I was saying, you haven't gone far enough, can you please just get a big a uh, jam jar of mosquitoes from the po forest and please release them so that it really is like a forest. Can you please get a few ticks and a few snakes to crawl around so it really is coming close to nature? <laughs> do you really want to go back to nature? <clears throat> if you do, please come to our monastery and I will put you out under a tree <laughs> for a day or two. <laughs> So yeah, there's some freedom which we get so going back to nature, but there's a lot of irritations and difficulties as well. And so that's really not freedom. Or I'm going to be giving a talk, we haven't announced this yet, in July in the UWA extension, I only got sort of the title of the talk which we're going to be giving uh, on July sometime in UWA. And it's again with uh, an interfaith talk, you know, with um, <coughs> a Catholic priest, you know, uh, Frank Sheehan from Christ Church, uh, a rabbi and myself. And it's entitled, A Priest, a Rabbi, a Monk Walk into a Bar. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good title. I think I suggested that, so it's a very good one to say. But it's all about just how these religions actually deal with the difficulties of modern life. And one of the things, and I must be coming to this, uh, the talks, because one of the things they said, why is it that we, we have the freedom to have all this space in the, the houses in which we live? So we all got our own rooms. We got many rooms, but we don't feel there's something missing there. We're losing something. And it's one of the things that when we are having these huge spaces, I've often pointed this out, we're not meeting each other, not interacting. We've got freedom from being confined, but we're also losing out on love and personal connections as well. So be careful because when you are free from your mother, from your father, from all these other people who give you a hard time when you are young, yeah, they're not there anymore. You're free of them, but you're also losing something else as well. Losing out the relationships which we form in life. So sometimes some of the freedoms which we have, the freedom of individual, individuality, the freedom of space, sometimes that it's not much of a freedom at all. We're losing too much at the same time. Of course, having been born in a poor family, in a family which was just in a, a government-assisted housing in London. It was so small, our house in which I grew up, that you had to get to know everybody. 
I always shared a room as long as I knew with my brother. We would fight, but you know, we're just young men, you always fight. But I couldn't escape from him, and he couldn't escape from me. We did not have our own rooms, which meant that we had to get on with each other. We had to learn how to love each other. I didn't have the freedom of space, but eventually I had the freedom of love. Being able to be with someone, and being happy to be there. And that starts giving you some more understanding of what real freedom is. The places where we look for freedom are not really where we find it. Which is why many people in our lives die before we find the meaning of freedom. And the whole idea of the spiritual path is actually to give us an understanding of what real freedom truly is. And I mentioned at the very beginning what real freedom is. And I think that you understand this. Real freedom is where you're not controlled. Now, I think you can understand that much of our life we are controlled. We are controlled when we're young by our parents, which is why we rail against that. We want to be free. But even when sort of you get old, get to an age of maturity, still there's many, many people, some people came to see me recently, that when it's choosing your partner, some of our cultures, some of our filial piety, the respect we have to our parents is just so strong that even though we know that we should be able to choose our life and choose our partners and choose where we want to live. Sometimes we struggle with the fact that we respect and love our parents. Maybe they may have paid for our education. And we feel confined in this double bind. Yes, my freedom is to do what I think is appropriate in life, but I must also have this cultural respect for my elders. And in Australia we don't have that so much. But nevertheless, you don't want to upset your parents, even in Australia. And just how do we deal with such things? How do we find freedom in that? And a lot of the times we realize that controlling, can we really be free of control? It seems that if we let go of one type of control, we get another problem. As far as Buddhism is concerned, we always find a little bit of a balance there. As I said to this couple, as I say to everybody, in Buddhism, this is the cultural heart of many traditions, whether it's Sri Lanka, Thailand, even Chinese traditions. Yes, we do respect our parents, but respect for our parents means that we take whatever they say to be very serious and very important. In other words, we give our parents the sayings and advice extra weight. But it doesn't mean that other things and other consideration can't outweigh our parents' advice. The respect means we take their words seriously. And then we think, we investigate, we get other people's advice and we understand our own needs and requirements. And sometimes it's the case that our ideas outweigh those of our parents. In the same way, the filial piety of Gautama the Buddha, he did not follow his father's advice. He left home. And if he had followed his father's advice, we would never have a Buddha today. But he didn't leave his home just casually. He considered it, realized what he wanted to do. So as far as feeling free of parental influence, these influences are there. They need to be respected, but they don't always need to be followed. And this is what I mean about having a sense of freedom. That we have to accept there are many influences and responsibilities and duties which we have in our life. 
And it's actually how we balance those duties is where we find our freedom. You cannot live in the world without some type of controlling. That's part of our life. Our body so sort of tries to control us. We have demands of our, of our body. There are some times sitting here where it's very tough for me. My body keeps telling me, you need to go to the toilet. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately part of my training as a monk, I think this is part of the training that all monks and nuns have to have, is being able to sit in one place and you can't get up and go to the loo. My teacher Ajahn Chah was very strong on that. I think that's why that these days the training we got in Thailand, sometimes we sit there for hours and hours and hours and hours. So we've got a lot of endurance in that area of our anatomy once you become a monk. <laughs> you didn't have any choice. And it's very helpful sometimes, especially these days when you go traveling. Because you know when you go traveling sometimes, you know, sometimes you get the window seat, and I remember this one occasion, you know, when I was, this is actually where your training as a monk really began to sort of bear fruit because I was traveling all the way from Thailand to London. And I had a window seat and the person sitting next to me was this very corpulent woman. In fact, she was very, very fat. I read in newspapers that sometimes they, they stop people like that even going on the aircraft because they take up more than two seats. And so I was actually imprisoned in the window seat. <laughs> it was true. And that's about a 16 hour journey. <laughs> and that really sort of took a lot of self restraint. But fortunately, you know, I, I, you couldn't go to sleep. You couldn't sort of just you know, read a book or something. I was waiting there, mindful every minute. And as soon as she got up, then I made a run for the loo. <laughs> and I was very, very quick because I had to get back before she got back and <laughs> <laughs> stop me going in. It's really good fun as a monk. Well, I managed it. I did it. So you had to be very quick as a monk. And just, but anyway, so sometimes that life doesn't give you the freedom to do what you want. And so, how can you find freedom in life? Because not it's not just me as a monk going to a toilet. Sometimes you know what it's like. Sometimes that if you ever go to Serpentine, sometimes that I'm sitting there. I've just had the meal, it's a very delicious meal, and then people come up and ask me questions. And they come up and ask a question, then they leave, I think, oh good, I can go back now and go to the toilet, then somebody else comes up. And they come and ask a question, then somebody else comes up, and then somebody else comes up, and I'm dying to go to the loo. But I can't, because I don't know what it's like, that people think that monks don't go to the toilet. <laughs> and you're up there for three or four hours sometimes. But never mind. So I think, well, wouldn't it be very good to be like all the other young monks because they just eat their meal and they just go off and do whatever they want. But I have to stay there, you know, receiving guests and talking to people. But I realized a long time ago that whether you're a young monk, whether you're an old monk, whatever you're doing, you have to sometimes come to peace with your situation in life. It was, it was like this, as a young monk when I was in Thailand. You see, all the old monks, they were the ones who sat up there, you know, talking to all the people for hours and hours on end. But they were also the people who got the first choice of the food. You know, so if you ever come to our monastery, either Gigi Ganap or this monastery, you've got all this food, and the senior monk gets first choice. Now these days it's okay because we get lots and lots of food here, but in those days the food was very, very sort of uh, few and far between. And so, by the time the senior monks have had their food, all that was left for monks like me was just, you know, the leftovers, just the remains. It was hardly enough to eat. All the nice stuff, you know, those monks got. And also, just like today, in those days, the senior monks, the old monks, they were always fat. <laughs> it's tradition. <laughs> and in those days, if you ever see a photo of me, I was really thin. And I thought, look, look, those monks, they don't need all that food. Me, you know, I'm a young, thin, scrawny little monk. They should come to me first of all. And those old monks, anyway, they're probably all enlightened. And I've only just started off, you know, I've got my cravings, I like that food. 
And so I thought the food should come to me first of all, and those enlightened fat guys at the end, they should get the leftovers rather than the other way around. And it wasn't just that, because you can see even here that the senior monks, you see how thick my cushion is, and the junior monks get a much smaller cushion. <laughs> now, that was the same in Thailand as well, probably the same in Sri Lanka and Burma as well. The big cushions go to the seniors. And again, I was scrawny, all skin and bones, and we just no carpet, just sitting on concrete, and it just really, that concrete was very, very hard to sit on when you've got sort of no padding. And so I thought, those senior monks, they've got their own padding, they're so fat. <laughs> they don't need the cushions, I need the cushions, you should come and give it to me. And then I started to think also, you know those senior monks, they just sit up there all day talking to people, and there's a young monk, I was a monk who had to do all the work, you know, they say sweep the place, clean the toilets, you know, and I had to do that, and they never did all that. Any work projects which they had, the senior monks decided, yes, we should you know, build this, we should sort of uh, you know, make that path or whatever, or make that toilet in that particular place. The senior monks, they decided to do it and draw all the plans, but who did the work? Yeah, me and all the other young It's really unfair. And I thought that, you know, this is not proper. Now I'm a senior monk. <laughs> I, think, I think, you know, it's not fair. Why do I always have to sit up here and give all the talks? Why do I have to sort of, you know, always, <laughs> always have to think about what building projects we need next and stuff like that? And that's where I found out this, this what we call sort of um, junior monk suffering. Because when you're a junior monk, not getting much food and also not, not being able to control what you're, you know, the work you have to do is all decided by the senior monks. That was called like junior monk suffering or dukkha. Now I'm a senior monk, I don't have that anymore. I have old monk suffering. <laughs> and it is suffering sometimes, always having to go and give talks and sometimes people see you I mentioned that story once and I was oh, overseas giving talks, I think it was the United States. Uh, and when I go overseas, I work really hard. If you see the schedules which I, I have, it's on the internet over there, you get up early in the morning, you're talking all day and all evening and all, m most of the night as well. So you don't get much rest, because you only go over to these places every, you know, every year or two years. And so when they're there, they just squeeze every drop of juice out of you. But I don't mind, I mean that's giving. But I had just come back from the United States and they just squeezed, squeezed, squeezed all the juice out and I was just so tired and I came back and I was transited in Singapore. I know so many people in Singapore who work for Singapore Airlines, they get access to the airport. So I didn't come out but they were waiting for me at the gate. And of course when they wait for you, they gate, come and have a cup of tea and coffee but they're not really, they're not you know, really wanting to give you a cup of tea and coffee, they want to ask their questions. Can I ask you a question? And so they're sitting down there, and I didn't have much time to drink the tea or the coffee, I forget which one it was, because they were just asking me all these questions on meditation, on Buddhism. And I was just so tired. So I thought, how can I get out of this without upsetting people? Because you know, you're a monk, you're not supposed to upset. These are kind people, they've got a good heart. But I was tired, I didn't want to upset them, so I thought, I need to go to the toilet. Because <laughs> you thought, at least in a toilet, you can have some peace and quiet as a monk. <laughs> that no one will disturb you there. And what happened? I went into the toilet in Changi Airport and for those of you who've been travelling and know that airport, you know, it's such a well-organised country that every toilet place has a toilet attendant. And you know what happened? The toilet attendant recognised me. Are you Ajahn Brahm? I said, yes. Can I ask you a question on meditation? <laughs> and, oh no! Even in the toilet I can't escape. <laughs> so there I realised what senior monk suffering is. And I realised senior monk suffering is not having to do these things, it's like complaining about them. That was my suffering. So I decided afterwards, ah, oh, just who cares, let's just do this. When I stopped complaining about these things and just enjoyed it, you know that uh, toilet attendant, he was so impressed, he said, can I make a donation? And those monks were not supposed to accept any money. And this was a poor fellow. 
And I said, well, you know, the, I can't accept it, but you can send it to our monastery. And he said, oh, can you give me the address? And the only piece of paper we could find was a piece of toilet paper. <laughs> and it was true, you know, I wrote the address of this monastery on a piece of toilet paper. And you wouldn't believe, about a week later, a donation came through from that man. And I thought, wow, that just really inspired me. A poor person, just you know, on a toilet paper, just asking me a question. He was, had so much generosity, so much kindness, he wanted to sort of make a donation. I thought, wow, that was brilliant. That really made my day. I forget how much it was, only a small amount, but it doesn't matter the amount. The fact he did that and went to all that trouble, wow. So it was wonderful that that experience of being harassed in the toilet in Singapore Airlines, in Singapore Airport, was a great teaching for me about what freedom truly is. The freedom is actually realizing that you're out of control, that you can't control your environment. So you stop trying to control. And that's where my freedom started coming from. I can't control my life. You always try to. You control your life. But you know, how much success have you had so far? <laughs> you know, directing your life. You had all the plans you had when you were young. I don't know what plans you had when you were young. All my plans I had when I was young, I just I forgot about them, went out the window, total failure. Do you have any plans now, what are you going to do? Come on, get real. Stop planning. And instead just you know, live from day to day. And just realize that life gives you things you never expect and you can't sort of plan, let alone control your life. So as soon as I stopped trying to control my life, I felt all this wonderful sense of freedom. Also, you learnt as a monk to at least be free of your past and your future. And that's one part of freedom which people are really crazy about. All of your history and past, what happened to you? Yeah, I remember these things, but I laugh about them. Even the sort of the painful and stupid things which you do from time to time. You just laugh at them and, and have fun with them. But why do people keep being prisoners of their past? I remember with Dennis many, many years ago, we went to a grief and loss conference. Remember that one at uh, Observation City in uh, Scarborough Beach? I think it's changed its name now, but uh, nothing to do with what I said. They changed their name. But anyway, that when we went there, that they gave a talk on just how to deal with grief and how to be free of it. You know, that somebody died, someone you're very, very close to, and a wonderful person, you love them very much, and you're just so sad. How can you get freedom from that terrible feeling? And it's not that hard to do. You know, we've got you know, other talks and other sort of CDs tell you how to let go of grief, and it's an easy thing to do. You know, I mentioned that my own father died when I was 16. I let go of that immediately. I was free of it. I love that man very much, but he can have no grief. This is similarly the concert, which you can look up. I've said it many times. It's in the book. It's on many tapes. But the thing was, you could do that. But there was one woman who came up afterwards and she blasted me. She was so upset at me. She was so angry at me. And I couldn't understand why you were angry when I was trying to help you and show your way out of your suffering. And she was saying, I'm very angry at you for trying to take away my suffering. For trying to take away my grief. And I just realized that sometimes people just don't want to be free. It's very similar to the person who's in prison and the term of their imprisonment is up and the door's open. But they've been in prison for 30, 40 years. They just don't want to go. They're used to their confinement. That particular woman was so used to her grief, she did not want to walk away. Now that's an important point. Sometimes we have the option to be free, but sometimes it means we're going to a place we're not used to. It takes a lot of courage to walk out of prison when you've been there for many years. It takes a lot of guts to truly go the path of freedom. It's the same with people who plan for the future. 
I've already mentioned in meditation, just let go of the future. Now is the place, you, time your future is being made. So just look after this present moment. But can you do that? Why are people so anxious and plan and plan and plan and plan? You know why? It's because you're so used to that. You don't know what to do if you weren't planning something. This is why you see all these people, they've got nothing they really need to do. But they make things to do. They make fantasies to plan. And they just don't know what it's like to be free. So freedom from the past and freedom from the future is not an easy freedom to find. So in this spiritual path, I confess we trick you. We trick you into that freedom of letting go just by giving you a taste. It's just like these free offers you see in the newspapers, because I do read newspapers. A special offer, buy one of these books, it's for free. And if you don't like it, you can send it back afterwards. And as soon as you buy one book, you find it's not so easy to send back again. And you get another book next week and the week after that. <laughs> It's similar what we're doing here, but in a more benign way. Because we teach you a little bit of meditation. It's for free. You can leave it if you don't like it. But once you start getting what the Buddha called a taste of freedom, you're hooked. <laughs> That's why 300, 400 people come here every week. The taste of freedom, it's not the taste of the curry puffs, although they're very delicious. It's the taste of the freedom there, because you get into these little moments of meditation, and no past, no future, there's no desires, nothing you want, and you feel just so free. Now, I must admit also, that the first time I meditated, I got a taste of freedom. I didn't know why, I couldn't put it into words, but this was important, this was so wonderful, just to be sitting there and having hardly a thought in my mind, no wanting, nothing to do, and feeling this great sense of freedom. That's not supposed to happen yet. I told you we can't control things, that's supposed to happen at nine o'clock. <laughs> Eddie! <laughs> you, see, you see, you can't control anything, you know, even this place. It just happens. So, what is your response to that? To get really upset at things you can't control? That, here we go, that <laughs> is what suffering is. So when you just let go of controlling, and let go of the past and future, what you're letting go of and this is actually the, the heart of this talk, which is a point which I made. You discover there are two types of freedoms. And once you understand these two types of freedoms, you really start to understand what the meaning of the religious path is. And why meditation is so delightful. And why what we're doing here is very, very radical. We're actually finding a true freedom. And those two types of freedom, the first is called the freedom of desire. The freedom of desire is of your freedom to control the world, to make it this way or that way, whatever you feel is important in life. The freedom to follow your desires, to fulfill your desires. It's called the freedom of desire. And that is a freedom which Western societies have celebrated have valued and try their utmost to cultivate. To be able to increase your wealth every year and your freedom to travel, to experience whatever you wish to experience in life, to go wherever you wish, to marry whoever you want, to follow your sexual inclinations of either being a straight, gay or even weirder celibate like me. <laughs> You have the freedom to do that. You have the freedom to sort of express yourself, dress as you wish. 
It's the freedom of desire. And this is what most people follow in life. You have a desire, a want, a goal. Follow it, achieve it. But the other type of desire is far more profound. We call it the freedom from desire. The freedom from desire is that the crackers can go off. Okay, that's all right. You don't desire them not to go off. You can actually make a fool of yourself. That's all right. You don't have a desire to impress other people. You don't have any desires at all. You have a freedom from desires, a freedom from having to control life. Instead, you just are. Are with the moment. Just are with whatever happens. And just enjoy the moment and learn to be at peace with it. When you realize just how little you can control in life, then you realize just how desires, which is just trying to control things, just makes things far more complicated. Now one of the reasons why you get a taste of freedom when you're meditating is you're following the path of freedom from desire. For a few minutes you're sitting there, you don't want anything. No past, no future, no thinking. Just sitting here with nothing missing, no place to go, nothing to be, not trying to fulfill any uh, anybody's wishes. Just being here, just being you, just being in this moment with not a desire in this world. We call that the freedom from desire. And that's one of the reasons why being a monk you feel so much freedom. Yeah, there's so many things which I can't do, but I'm just happy to be here. And when you're happy to be here, you feel the freedom from desire. Yeah. When you're in the airport and somebody's asking you a question, I don't want to be here, I don't want this to happen, then you're not free anymore. But when you're in a situation you can't control, you just, this is good enough. I can enjoy this weird experience of have giving a Dhamma talk in the toilet of Changi Airport. <laughs> now that means you're totally free. Because you're being with life rather than trying to fight against life. Being with it. But some people, they will complain. If you have an attitude like that Ajahn Brahm, just no desire. How will there ever be any progress in this world? How will we ever solve any of these problems in life? And these are real problems. And the answer is most of those problems come from people trying to follow their own desires, their own greeds, trying to control you and try to control others. That's where most of the problems come from in the first place. Wouldn't it be wonderful? if our personal desires were less, that we needed less, we needed less things in life, and we didn't sort of demand so much from each other. We all know that relationships are just so hard to make last, and we all know that it's because we expect too much of each other. You know that because other people expect too much of you. That's why it's so hard to do with others. The demands on you are just so, so great that you don't feel free at all. Imagine that somebody just respected you for who you are and they had no demands on you at all. They just loved you unconditionally. And they never tried to control you. What a wonderful relationship that, relationship that would be. That's called freedom. Freedom from control. Freedom from desire. Just allowing you to be who you are. Now imagine if you could have that relationship to life. In the same way you can love a person for who they are. To love life for what it is. Imagine you could have that relationship to yourself. To love you for who you are. And to stop trying to control yourself and make yourself something different or something better. When you try and make yourself better, you usually end up making yourself worse. 
So making peace with yourself. Because peace is the expression of freedom from desire. Which is why in my own journey for freedom, you find as a young man, as you know some of the old stories, I was a bit of a hippie as a young man. I wasn't into drugs because I didn't really see that actually freeing a person. But certainly I was into having long hair and if I wanted my hair long, I'm going to have my hair long. I had my green velvet jeans, no trousers. I had my green velvet trousers. Why was that? Because I was expressing my own freedom. And I realized, I think, went to my first rock concert and found about a thousand other people the same type of green velvet trousers I had. And I realized I was, I was not free anymore. I was just following, being controlled by fashion just like everybody else. And even now, you know, that you have a bald head and I thought I'm being unique. And now you see all these other people shaving their heads as well. And it's become another fashion statement. If I'm going to be radical, I have to grow my hair again. <laughs> but all this time about trying to be individual, trying to be free, you just can't do it that way. So, in all that pursuit of freedom on the outside, you finally realize that true freedom comes with a sense of being at peace with things, of accepting things rather than trying to control things so much. And each one of you, if you can, just let go of control a little bit. Let go of the control of the person you live with. Let go of control of your children, if your parents. You'll be creating more freedom in this world. And most of all, be more at peace with yourself. As a fat monk who's old, a junior monk who's skinny, that's just nature, that's just what happens. So, instead of arguing with it, instead of trying to change what really can't be changed, just make peace with it. Making peace means the freedom from desire. And then you find this amazing amount of happiness and harmony in your life. I'm going to finish with an old story, but a very profound story. Because very often, as a Buddhist monk, especially going to interfaith conferences, that you have to try and explain some of the most difficult concepts to people who have got no background in Buddhism. And one of the most difficult of those concepts is the, the goal of Buddhism itself, Nibbana. And so sometimes people ask you, what is Nibbāna? What are we really doing here? What is our goal? Is Nibbāna another type of heaven? Or what actually is it? Unfortunately, there's a wonderful simile which ties into what I've been saying so far about the meaning of Nibbāna. And there's many kids here today. They come, maybe not for the talk, but for the, the razzmatazz coming in five minutes time. But even kids can understand this story. This was a story which is in one of my books, which I often tell at retreats, but very rarely tell on a Friday night at Nolamara, about the five children playing the wishing game. The wishing game goes like this. Five children each have a wish, and the child who comes up with the best wish will win the wishing game. So the first child says, if I had a wish, I'd wish for a new video game because mm -hmm. I like playing video games. Very good. Second child who had a little bit longer to think said, if I had a wish, I'd wish for a video game store. So I don't get one video game, I can get the next one which comes up. I can have as many video games as I want. Very good. The third child, again, having more time to think, said, no, no, that's not a good wish. If I had a wish, this was a very smart kid, if I had a wish, I would ask for one billion dollars US. <laughs> because with one billion dollars US, first of all, I would buy my own video game store. That's first. 
Secondly, because the problem as a kid playing video games is your mother keeps telling you to do your homework instead. So he said, after buying my own video game store, then I'll buy my own school. Because when I own a school, I won't need to give myself any homework. And because I own the joint, I can always give myself top marks after every grade. And once I graduated from my own school, then I can sell the school and buy my own university. And I can give myself you know, many degrees because I own the place, and I can play video games all the time. And with a billion dollars, I can do all of that. And when I grow up and think what else I want, I'll have plenty of money to buy whatever I want. Because a billion dollars is more money than anyone can spend in a whole lifetime. So that was a billion dollar wish. Now that was by far ahead of all the other wishes. The two children left to play this wishing game. And the fourth child, if you say two billion or three billion, that's exactly the same as one billion. One billion means as much money as you could ever use. The fourth child did a much better wish than the billion dollar wish. The fourth child said, if I had a wish, I'd wish for three wishes. That's a wish. And for my first wish, I'll have a video game store. For my second wish, I'll have billion dollars US. For my third wish, I'll have three more wishes. <laughs> that way, I can go on forever. Be that. <laughs> That's a very smart kid. The kid who had an infinity of wishes granted. Now how can you beat that? The fifth child would win that wishing game. They managed to formulate a wish that was clearly superior than having an infinity of wishes granted. The last child said, if I had a wish, I wish I was so content I never needed any more wishes ever again. <laughs> I wish I was so content I never needed any more wishes. I was wishing for the freedom from desire. The fourth child, the infinity of wishes, was called the freedom of desire. As many desires as you want, granted. The last child was asking for the end of desire. So content, I don't need any more wishes. That's true freedom. And that's one of the most eloquent descriptions of Nirvana. So content, you don't need any more wishes. That is freedom.